Section 3.8, Related Rates. We will now look at the rates of change with the variables changing with respect to time. A couple examples, a passenger ship and an oil tanker left port sometime in the morning, the former headed north and the latter headed east. How fast was the distance between the two ships changing at that time? So the rate of the passenger ship and the oil tanker are related as we find the distance between them and its rate of change. Suppose oil spills from a ruptured tanker and spreads in a circular pattern. If the radius is increasing at one meter per second, how fast is the area increasing? The rate of the radius is changing and the area is changing, and we're trying to see how those two rates are related to each other. Let's dig in deeper to that first one about the passenger ship and the oil tanker. So a passenger ship and an oil tanker left port sometime in the morning, the former headed north and the latter headed east. At noon, the passenger ship was 40 miles from port and sailing at 30 miles per hour, while the oil tanker was 30 miles from port and sailing at 20 miles per hour. How fast was the distance between the two ships changing at that time? So this is a pretty complicated process, and I think what I want to do with you is go ahead and show you the process down here first, and then we'll go back up and apply the process to this example. So the first thing you want to try and do is find a formula that's related to the situation and pictures are often useful. So let's go ahead and take that step one and try and carry it out. So let's try and find a picture that illustrates everything that's going on. So I'll start off with this dot representing our port. And then it says that the passenger ship was heading north. So from the port, I'll draw a line straight up. And that represents the passenger ship. And the oil tanker is headed east, so I'll draw a line straight off to the right. And that one represents our oil tanker. And then we want to look at how the distance between them is changing. So I'll draw a dashed line here that represents that distance. And I'll put a capital D for that. And then since this uh, east path is horizontal, I'll label that distance traveled as x. And for the vertical distance of the northbound ship, I'll label that one as a y. And we want to use this picture to somehow get an equation that relates all of these things together. Well, because one ship is going directly north and the other directly east, we have a right angle right here. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem. The sum of the squares of the legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. So the sum of the squares of the legs would be x squared plus y squared equals d squared. So I know they told us like how far the different ships have traveled, but these distances are changing over time. And so we wanna make sure we leave them as variables for now. We'll come back and plug in numbers for them later. But we've now accomplished step one. We found a formula that is related to the situation. We use this picture to help us get there. So now we wanna introduce rates into this because right now I just have distances. X is the distance the tanker has traveled, Y is the distance the passenger ship has traveled, and D is the distance between them. But we can introduce rates by differentiating. So we're gonna take that formula that we have or equation that we have, differentiating it. And we're gonna find the derivative of that. We're gonna do it implicitly and usually we're going to do that with respect to t. So that means that we're going to take the derivative with respect to t of both sides of our equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Notice that t is not one of the variables in the equation. So when we did implicit derivatives before, usually some of the pieces had our variable and others didn't, and so we had to use the chain rule like on the y part, but not on the x part when we were doing the dx. Well, now we're doing a derivative with respect to t, and t is not one of our variables, so every one of these has to um, have the chain rule applied to it. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to t of both sides. So when you start off with the x squared, you think, what's its derivative? And everything we've learned so far should say, well, that's just going to be 2x. But 2x is the derivative if we take the derivative of that with respect to x. Because it's not with respect to x, it's res with respect to t, we have to multiply by the chain rule part the derivative of the inside piece with respect to t. And the inside piece, the thing that was inside the square, was an x. So we have to multiply that by dx dt. 
and we just do something very similar for all the other pieces. So if you just thought of y as a normal derivative, the derivative would be 2y by the power rule. But since we're differentiating with respect to t, not y, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside piece, which was that y, with respect to t. And then we do the same thing on the other side. Derivative of d squared would be 2d times the derivative of d with respect to t. I hope you did a capital d like I did, because if you put a lowercase d there, it gets mixed up with the d in our derivative. So you want to try and never use a lowercase d as a variable in calculus stuff, because you're going to have that d from the derivative showing up as well. All right, so that was step two. We introduced rates by differentiating with respect to t. And what do we mean we have rates? Well, let's highlight some stuff here. Here's the rate at which the horizontal ship, so I think that was the tanker, is changing with respect to time. Here's the rate at which the passenger ship's distance from the port is changing with respect to time. And here's the rate at which the distances from each other is changing with respect to time. So taking that derivative with respect to t did in fact introduce rates. All right, so what's next? Identify what rates are known and what rates you want to find. Okay. So let's go in there and start looking around for some rates. So I see this 40 miles, but that's not a rate. That is a distance. So the rate is the 30 miles per hour. So that's the rate for which one? The passenger ship, which was the one that was sailing north. So that was our vertical one. So that is our dy dt. So the rate at which y is changing with respect to t is 30 miles per hour. And I'll just put a 30 here for now, and we'll bring back the units when we get further into this. When we go to the next ship, the oil tanker, it's sailing at 20 miles per hour, and it's the horizontal one. So that means that dx dt is equal to 20. And then it says, how fast was the distance between the two ships changing? That's the last part, right? There's the question. This is the question they're asking us. How fast was the distance between the two ships changing at that time? That's going to be dd dt. So that's what we're trying to, to find out. So what do we know so far? We know that dx dt equals 30. We could plug that in there. We know, sorry, that was... Uh, dy dt, so we'll plug that in here, and the dx dt is 20, so that's going to go in this spot over here. So in order to finish this off, we need to know x, y, and d, so how are we going to get those? Well, they tell us that at noon, the passenger ship was 40 miles north, so at the point that we're interested in, y is going to be equal to 40. Remember, the passenger ship is the one going north, so since that was the, the vertical one, I labeled that as a Y. And then the oil tanker was 30 miles east of the port at that point, so that was our horizontal distance, so that means that the X is 30. So if we highlight those as well, there's our Y equals 40, there's our X equals 30. We could plug those in here and here. So we're trying to find the green part, d, 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 t. We can only really solve for that if we know all of the other parts. And so we still need to know this d right here. And that is a d, not a zero, right? So we need to find that capital D, but we can use our equation right here to do that. So now that we know x and y, we can say x squared, 30 squared, plus y squared, 40 squared, is equal to d squared. And I think I've started to slip into step four. So let's just drop down here real quick and look at that. Once you've thought about what rates are known and what you want to find, now you're thinking about what numbers are known and trying to solve for the desired rate. So that's what I'm trying to work on now. And in order to find the desired rate dd dt, I need to know x, y, and capital D. So now we're using the x and the y to get the capital D. So we could take the square root of both sides now and get our value of d, and d would be the square root of 30 squared plus 40 squared, and what is that 30 squared plus 40 squared? So let's see, 30 squared plus 40 squared 
is 2,500. So D is going to be the square root of 2,500, which is 50. So now we can go ahead and go back, highlight that one, also in orange. Now we've got that piece too, right? So we can plug in everything now except for the D, 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 T. So let's do that. So I'm taking this equation right here and just going from left to right, plugging in all the different things we know. So we have 2 times x would be 2 times 30 times dx dt, which was 20, plus 2 times y, and the y is 40, times dy dt, and that's 30, is equal to 2 times capital D, which we now know is 50, times dd dt, which we do not know. But that's the only piece we don't know. So we can now divide both sides right here by 100. And if we do that, then over on the right-hand side, 2 times 50 is 100. So those cancel. And d, 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 t would be by itself. So then it's just a matter of working out that numerator and seeing what we get. So the 2 times 30 times 20 is 1,200. And the 2 times 40 times 30 is 2,400. And that's all going to be divided by 100. And, and 1,200, let's see, I should put no pies here. So 1,200 plus 2,400 is 3,600, which divided by 100 is 36. And what is that 36? If we go back, that's... That is this piece right here, d, 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 t. So that was the piece we were looking for. And 36 what? Well, it's a rate of change. And the dx, dt was 30 miles per hour. The dy, dt was 40 miles per hour. So the d, d, dt is 36 miles per hour. And that's our answer. So let's go back and look at all the steps below again and fill in the last piece as well. So find a formula related to the situation, maybe by drawing a picture. So we started off drawing a picture of the ship going north and east, which formed a right angle. And then we drew the distance in between them because they were talking about that. We got a right triangle, so we used Pythagorean theorem to get a formula. Then introduce rates by differentiating both sides with respect to t as long as the rate is with respect to time, which it was. So then we did that. Something we'll need to get used to a little bit, using implicit differentiation when there is only uh, when none of the variables are the one we're differentiating with respect to. So we have to use the chain rule over and over again. Identify what rates were known and which ones we wanted to find. And as they read a rate, like the speed of a ship, I wrote it down as a dx dt or a dy dt. And then think about the numbers that were given, like one ship was 40 miles north, one was 30 miles east. Plug those in to the original equation to find any unknown variable pieces. We did that, and then we did algebra to solve for the rate. Make sure that at the end you're checking your units to make sure you put the appropriate units on them. And then make sure that your answers are reasonable. And just in terms of making sure your answer is reasonable, like what, what if we forgot to divide by the 100 and we came up with the distance between the two ships was changing at 3,600 miles per hour? That wouldn't make any sense. If one ship's going 30 miles an hour and the other one's going 20 miles an hour, how could it possibly be that they're going apart from each other so fast? And the other thing you could think about is, you know, like what if one ship um, was going straight up and the other one was going straight down? Then it'd be 30 miles one direction, 30 miles per hour in one, 20 in the other. So it'd be 50 miles per hour they're going apart if they were going directly opposite. Here they're not going directly opposite, so it's not quite 50. So the 36 does seem like a reasonable answer. And just make sure you're thinking about that a little. If you never think about if your answer is reasonable, sometimes that'll mean that you made some silly error that you could have caught if you just thought about that piece. And you'll end up giving an answer that really makes no sense when somebody else reads it. So nobody wants that. All right, so we've got this new process. It's a little bit scary sounding and it's all word problems. So what we're gonna do is example, 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 and hopefully make it start to feel a little bit better. 
So each side of a square is increasing at a rate of six centimeters per second. At what rate is the area increasing when the area is 16 centimeters squared? So this one will be a little bit easier, I think. We'll start off drawing a picture of our square. Hopefully I'll do a reasonable square. That seems pretty good, especially with the magic of notability. All right, so let's label the sides of the square as L. We could do a W, we could do an S. That's not that important. And then we want to think about the two things that we're trying to find, area versus the side. So we want some formula that relates the area to the side. And that would be the formula that area is equal to L squared. So I write that over here on the side, area equals L squared. And if you look at the derivatives, or sorry, the rates they're giving us, six centimeters per second, right? And that is a rate with respect to time. So per second means that we're doing a with respect to D type of derivative. So then that's what we want to do is take the derivative of both sides, take the derivative of both sides with respect to time. So when all you have sitting there is your variable, that always means you just get the derivative of that variable with respect to time. Like there's nothing to do except for write that we want that derivative. It's equivalent to writing a prime. I like using the d something dt notation here to kind of always remind us which variable we're working with respect to and that we're showing that we're mixing time into this. On the other side, we have l squared. So use the power rule and get 2l. But you're differentiating a variable that was not t, so you have to differentiate the inside variable, which was the l, or the inside function, which was l, with respect to t. So we get dl dt as a multiplier there. So much simpler than last time in terms of the equation, and we have less pieces and all of that. So now we just want to think about what's given and what are we trying to find. So uh, let's go ahead and start labeling those things. So let's just read through an order here. It says each side of a square is increasing at a rate of 6 centimeters per second. So that piece right there is saying the rate at which the side is changing. So that means that dl dt is equal to six. So you gotta pay attention to, is it a side length they gave you right there, or is it a rate at which a side length was changing? And you can tell by the per and having time involved, then it's gonna be a rate. At what rate is the area increasing? So that part right there, at what rate is the area increasing, tells you what they want you to find. Let's do some highlighting there. Let's go with the pink. This is what they want us to find the rate at which the area is increasing, so that would be a dA dt, so this is what they want us to find. So in order to find that, we need to plug in L and dL dt, and we know dL dt, that's right here, so we still need this L. We already know the dL dt, so if we can find L, we can plug in and have the answer. So how do we get the L? Well, they tell us they want to know the answer when the area is 16. So now we use this together with that. We plug the 16 in for the area and say 16 equals L squared. We take the square root of both sides and we get L equals 4. Just a reminder, by the way, when you take a square root, it's really L equals plus or minus 4. But since we're doing the distance of the side of a square, only a positive makes sense. In any case, there's the other piece we need. So now we know dl dt, we know l. That's all the pieces except for the one we're trying to find. So we want to know dA dt. The formula right above where I'm writing says that's 2 times l, which would be 4, times dl dt, which would be 6. So dA dt is equal to 2 times 4, which is 8, times 6, which would be 48. And then we just want to think about what would the units be on that. Well, if the side length is given in centimeters, then the area would be centimeters square, and the derivative is with respect to time, so that would be per second. So it's 48 centimeters squared per second. And because it's a word problem, it, it might actually be nice to, to say kind of a word answer. So there is dA dt, but the area is increasing. at a rate of 48 centimeters squared per second. 
I like to throw this idea in there. When somebody asks how things are changing, you really should probably tell them whether it was increasing or decreasing. So if we went back to the ships, they were going apart from each other. So it probably would have been a better answer if we said that the distance between them was increasing at a rate of 36 miles per hour instead of just giving the rate. So trying to always mix in that idea of is it increasing or is it decreasing? And you get that idea, by the way, just off of whether your derivative is coming out to be a positive or a negative answer. And if it comes out negative, that means it's decreasing. Make sure that makes sense. So we were supposed to think about that, right? That was our last step. Do things make sense? If the side lengths of a square are increasing, then of course the area is increasing also. And I guess in some ways we can get away with not saying increasing because they already kind of mentioned that it was going to be increasing. I think it's more important to say whether it was increasing or decreasing if they ask you at what rate were, were things changing, then it could be either. But it's it's probably a good idea to just always throw that in there. And in terms of the, the units, we're supposed to look at that too. So how does that work out? The units on L were just centimeters. And the units on DL, DT were centimeters per second. So when you multiply that together, that's centimeters times centimeters or centimeters squared per second. So that's kind of where that came from. I just put the correct units on because I knew what they should be for area. But if you really want to check your work, you go back and think about the units on the pieces. And when you multiply them together, does it really give you the units that you want? And in this case, it does. All right, let's look at another example. Suppose oil spills from a ruptured tanker and spreads in a circular pattern. If the radius of the spill is increasing at a rate of one meter per second, how fast is the area increasing when the, radi when the radius is 30 centimeters squared? So... We've got a circular pattern, so I'll start off by drawing a circle, hopefully a perfect one. There we go. Uh, and let's see, what are they talking about? So we've got the circular pattern, they've got a radius that they're talking about, and they're talking about an area as well. So we want to think about a circle and how do we relate area and radius together. So if we drew a line in the center and drew a line from the center to the edge, that line would be a radius, and then we know from geometry that the area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. So that formula gives us something that relates them together. If we look at the types of rates that are given, one meter per second means that the rate has time in its denominator. So we want our derivatives to be with respect to time. So we take this formula that we found, we take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. On the left, it's just the variable itself, no no formulas involved, just A statically, so it's A prime or D A D T. On the other side, you might be tempted to use the product rule, because you're like, well, I have pi times r squared. <clears throat> but remember, pi is just a constant. If it was 8 times r squared, we wouldn't use the product rule, so we shouldn't do it when it's a pi either. Pi is not a function, it's just a number. So when you have a number up out front and you're taking the derivative, you just bring the power down, multiply it with whatever number was out front, so we just get a 2 pi out front and then r to the power one less, which would be a one. And that's what the answer would be if it was a derivative with respect to r. But because it's a derivative with respect to t, we have to say we have this inside function r that was being squared. And by the chain rule, we then have to multiply it by the derivative of that inside function, which would be dr dt. So now here's an equation that has the rates related to each other. And now we just want to think about what are the numbers they gave us, what do those represent, plug in what we can, and then hopefully just solve for the leftover one is what we want. Sometimes we need to do a little more work than that. Let's start digging in and see where this one falls. So let's look at numbers they gave us. What's this rate of one meter per second? Seems like a derivative. It's the rate that the radius is increasing. So that would be... The derivative of the radius with respect to time is 1. And by the way, if it said the radius was decreasing, I would make that a negative 1. So we do have to pay attention to those increasing, decreasing type of words. And they want to know how fast is the area increasing. So that's what they want us to find. Let's go ahead and mark that one with the, the pink. So how fast is the area increasing? That's what they want us to figure out. That would be area is changing so that would be da dt that's what we want to try and find 
So in order to find that successfully, we need all the other pieces. So we need to know R, and we need to know dr dt, and we do know dr dt. So the piece we still need is R, and that's given to us right here. They want to know how fast is the area increasing when the radius is 30. So we can write that one down too. So the radius is 30. This was one meter per second, and this was a radius of 30 centimeters. Just notice here, those two units are not the same. So we need to convert that all to be the same. We can either make it all meters or we could make it all centimeters. I don't think they really asked us like for one specific one, so we get to pick. So I'm gonna change this one right here. Um, it takes 100 centimeters to make a meter. So this would also be equal to, I guess we can just say equals instead of the arrow. So equals 100 centimeters per second. If you have different units between the two, that's going to cause a confusing answer. So you'd have mixed units in there. It would be kind of a mess. So it's good to notice that. Um, I, I know that we're supposed to think about units at the end. So I was thinking, hey, I should write units down on these pieces so I can make sure they're fitting together right. And that caused me to notice they were written in a different way. So then I can use that conversion to get them to be the same. But I know everything I need to now. DA, DT. According to the equation right above where I am, is 2 times pi times r, and the r is 30 centimeters, times dr dt, which if I have the units match, would be 100 centimeters per second. So there's all of our numbers. The 2 times the 30 is 60, times 100 would be 6,000, so it looks like the answer is 6,000 pi. And then what would the units on the 6,000 pi be? If you take centimeters per second times centimeters, you would get centimeters squared per second. And the units of area should be squared. So the units seem to be making sense. So that's part of our you know last step, making sure that things fit. And I don't know if they want an exact answer or decimal here. So if, if they want an exact answer, there it is. If they want us to give a decimal approximation, then we just need to plug in for pi. And that could seem simple, but there's some trickiness to that. So I want to go to the calculator and show you something there. If you take 6,000 times pi and you say pi is 3.14, you'll get this answer, 18,840. But if you take 6,000 pi and you say for pi, you're going to plug in the variable pi, which is above the raised to key. So I'll hit the orange second key and then the pi button. Now, instead of using three significant figures for pi, I'm using all of them. And notice I get a pretty different answer. I mean, the first three digits match, even the fourth one, but not beyond that. If you only put three significant figures for pi, 3.14, how are you going to really trust five significant figures in your answer. So if you're going to write an answer that's got a lot of digits in it, you need pi to have a lot of digits in it. And the easiest way to do that is not memorize pi to 10 digits, but to use the pi button on your calculator. So I'll take this more accurate version of pi and put that it's 18,849.56 centimeters squared. So let's go back and write that down. So approximately, because I'm going to round this, 18,849.56 centimeters squared per second. And again, which answer should you give? Generally, you should give it an exact answer unless they ask you to round it to two decimal places or round it to the nearest whole number or something like that. But it's good to be able to be ready for either form of answer they want from you. All right, we're going to go ahead and look at another example with ships, but this one has some pretty big differences in it from the last one, so probably important to see some variations. At noon, ship A is 150 kilometers west of ship B. Ship A is sailing east at 35 kilometers per hour, and ship B is sailing north at 25 kilometers per hour. How fast is the distance between the ships changing at 4 o'clock? All right, so the first thing is let's draw the initial situation. Ship A is west of ship B, so ship A we'll put here. Ship B we'll put over here to the, the right, which would be to the east in the kind of standard setup that we would do. And so we have this initial distance 
or this initial position right here of A and B. And then what happens from there? So ship A is sailing east. So ship A is going, let me do a different color there. Ship A is going this way. So it's heading towards where ship B was at noon. But ship B is not just staying put. What's ship B doing? Ship B is sailing north at 25 kilometers per hour. So ship B is going this way. So if we check in later, yes, ship A was heading towards ship B, but ship B has left and has gone in this different direction. So here's kind of our picture. And then the distance between them would look something like this. Initially, it was just a horizontal distance, but now as time has passed, they've, they've kind of changed their positions and now we've got this triangle between where A is now, where B used to be, and where B is now. So the key thing that we're trying to figure out is this, here's where B is now, here's where A is now, and how is that rate changing? All right, so that's the picture we want to work on. So we want to come up with some sort of equation for that. So we know that initially, this distance right here was 150. And then we can think about the, the distance that ships are traveling. So let's say, as time goes by, A will have gone X distance, which is this distance from of the red piece. In fact, let me match those up. So... Sorry, I missed a line. So right here, we'll let that X represent how far uh, ship A has sailed at any given time. And this Y will be how far B has traveled at any given time. And this could be our capital D like before. I didn't like using that capital D though, a little confusing and looked like a zero with my handwriting. So I'll use an R this time, but it's still the distance. So I want to come up with an equation, tempted to want to use the Pythagorean theorem again, except for I can't use x squared plus y squared equals r squared because x isn't one of the side of the triangle. The remaining, we have y as the side of the triangle, one of the legs. We've got a right angle right here. So the other leg of the triangle is this piece right here. So what would that piece be? Well, we know the total distance initially between A and B is 150, and then we've gotten rid of X of that distance by A sailing to the right or to the east. So the distance that's left is the total distance 150 So the total distance 150 minus that red X. So that's one of the sides of our triangle. So bringing that back out. So what's our equation then? It's still going to be the Pythagorean theorem, except for this time, one of the legs of our triangle is 150 minus X. So we square that plus the other leg of the triangle squared equals R squared. So there's a formula that relates everything together, where x is the distance a has traveled, y is the distance ship b has traveled, and r is the distance between them. But we want to know at what rate is the distance between them changing, so we need to take derivatives, and that derivative will be taken with respect to t. So our next step is to take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. So... We've got some extra chain rule going on here. If you want to just take the derivative of this piece, that already involves the chain rule because we have a quantity to a power. So you would bring the power down times the power one less times the derivative of the inside, which would be negative one. If you take the derivative of the negative x times the derivative of the x itself with respect to t, which would be dx dt. The other ones go a lot more like they did last time. Derivative of y squared is 2y. The chain rule piece is times dy dt. On the other side, the derivative of r squared would be 2r. The chain rule piece, because we're differentiating with respect to t, would be dr dt. So here's an equation, a messy one, but it fits it all together and it has rates in it. So now we want to start trying to gather all the information and catalog it. So it says ship A is sailing east at 35 kilometers per hour. 
So that's going to give us the rate of change of x with respect to t. So dx dt is equal to 35 kilometers per hour. And then they say ship B is sailing north at 25 kilometers per hour. So our north movement was the y. So that would be dy dt is equal to 35, oops, 25 kilometers per hour. So now what rates have we got? We know this rate and this one. We're still trying to find the rate at which the two are changing with respect to each other. So that's what we're going to ultimately try and solve for. So in order to solve for that, we need all the other pieces. So we still need x, y, and r. So let's start working on those now. So in order to find x, you have to think about how far has the ship gone since the beginning of the process. So the process started at noon, and they're asking us to see what the rate of change is at 4 p.m., so that's four hours later. And x is changing at a rate of 35 kilometers per hour, so after four hours, that would be four times 35, which is 140 kilometers. And the y, we would do the same sort of thing. Four hours later, if you're going at 25 kilometers per hour, 4 times 25 would give us 100. So we still don't know the r. So that's where we go back to this equation, the one we had before we took derivatives. And we can plug into that one to figure out the value of r. So what have we got there? So we have 150 minus x, so that would be 150 minus 140 squared plus y squared, which is 100 squared, is equal to r squared. So r is equal to the square root of all this stuff. And let's see, 150 minus 100 is 10 squared, which is 100, plus 100 squared, which is 10,000. So r is equal to the square root of 10,100. All right, so now we know a value of r, and we already knew the x and the y, and we've got the rates of change with respect to x and t. So now we can plug all of this stuff in and solve for dr dt. All right, through the magic of technology, I've just created a little bit of extra space for myself. But what we still have left to do is to take all the pieces and plug into this equation that has dr dt in it so that we can solve for dr dt. So taking that underlined piece in yellow and just working from left to right, we start off with the 2, 150 minus x, which is 140, squared times negative 1 times dx dt, which is 35. Moving on to the next term, we have plus 2 times y, so that would be 2 times 100 times dy dt, which is 25. And then that's all equal to 2 times r. r is that messy square root of 10,100. 10,100 times dr dt. And that dr dt is the piece that we want to get by itself. So if we take both sides and divide by 2 times the square root of 10,100, then we will arrive at our value for dr dt. All right, so let's head to the calculator and put all this in and we can round it to a couple decimal places. So because we have a lot of stuff in the numerator, make sure you start out with open parentheses. And then we had two times 150 minus 140. And then that was times negative 35. And then we were adding on to that 2 times 100 times 25. And that's the end of our numerator. So I would end the parentheses for the numerator and then divide it by. And we have two numbers in the denominator, so you need parentheses around that too. So 2 times the square root of 10,100. First end parentheses is on the square root. The second one ends the denominator. So it's nice that we're just going to, instead of simplifying all this, go to the calculator. But you do have to remember when there's multiple numbers in the numerator, put it all in parentheses. Multiple numbers in the denominator, you need all of that in parentheses. 
So I get uh, approximately 21.39. So let's take that back to the notes. So it looks like dr dt, and we're using a lowercase r, so I'll stick with that. dr dt is approximately equal to 21.39. And then what would the units be on that? This is the rate at which they were changing. All the other rates that we were doing were in kilometers per hour, so we'll be consistent with that, 21.39 kilometers per hour. So that's our answer. I'm going to go ahead and highlight it now confidently. But let's think a little bit about does it make sense if one of them is going at 35 kilometers per hour and the other one is going at 25, is it possible that we get a speed that's slower than either of those? I think it is because we have some strange stuff going on, right? It's like A is trying to sail over to B, but B is leaving. So as you start getting, as A starts getting closer to B, and by the way, the distance was almost gone. We were down to 10 kilometers from the initial distance of 150. So you're almost directly underneath ship B at that point. So most of the rate at which the distance is changing is caused by ship uh, B sailing upward at 25 kilometers per hour. But <clears throat> ship A is still closing the triangle a little bit, so that's going to slow that distance down. So I think 21.39 kilometers per hour is a reasonable answer. All right, let's go ahead and move on to another example. So an observer stands 300 feet from the launch site of a hot air balloon. The balloon is launched vertically and maintains a constant upward velocity of 20 feet per second. What is the rate of which, what is the rate of change of the angle of elevation of the balloon when the balloon is 400 feet above the ground? All right, let's start off with the picture. We've got some, the ground presumably flat. We've got a balloon that is at some point and is going to start rising upward from there. So the balloon is is doing this. We have an er observer over here. 300 feet away. So this distance from where the balloon takes off to where the observer is is 300 feet. They don't tell us how tall the observer is. So there's this weird little thing, but it's they're kind of pretending like the person is observing from ground level. So from, for some reason, our, our little observer here, arms, legs, whatever, he's laying down and he's looking at the balloon as it goes up. And they're asking about the angle of observation for that observer. So what is the angle between the ground and like the tilt they would have to put on their head to see the balloon go up? So what other variable is there? The balloon is going up and its distance is changing. So that we'll put a Y on there. And then we've got um, a right angle. And so you might think use Pythagorean theorem. But they're not asking about the distance between the observer and the balloon. They're asking at the rate at which the angle of observation is changing. So we need an angle not between leg, leg, and hypotenuse, but between theta and the y and the 300. And we do have the right triangle. So the theta there, how are the y and the 300 related? The y is the opposite of the angle, and the 300 is the adjacent. So we could do something with opposite over adjacent, which would be tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent, so y over 300. And by the way, if you're wondering why didn't I put an x instead of a 300, the person's not running to where the balloon used to be, so the distance between the person, the observer, and the launch point of the balloon is not changing. It's not a variable, it's just a constant. So I can just put that 300 in there and then now I have something that relates together the height of the balloon and the angle of observation that's occurring for the observer. If I take that and do a derivative with respect to t, then that will change that to be uh, a related rates equation because we'll now have d theta dt and dy dt in that equation. So I don't know this is a big deal, but I think I would like to multiply both sides by 300 here at the beginning just to get rid of the fractions. Not a big deal. Like I said, we could keep that and it wouldn't be that that hard, but let's just do the derivative this way. I think it'll be a little bit easier. So when you take the derivative of the left side, the constant, you just leave alone, 300. 
And then the tangent of theta, the derivative of that would be secant squared of theta. And that's what it would be if it was a derivative with respect to theta. But derivative is with respect to t. So since it's with respect to t, theta gets treated as a function inside of tangent. And so when we get done taking the derivative of the outside tangent, which is secant squared, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which would be d theta dt. On the other side, we just have the derivative of y, which would be y prime, or dy dt in this case. So now we start trying to figure out what pieces do we have, what pieces are we looking for. So we already have the 300 written down. The balloon is launched vertically and has an upward velocity of 200 feet per second. So y is the distance it's gone upward. So dy dt, the height of the balloon is changing at a rate of 20 feet per second. All right, so there's one of the pieces. What is the, what is the ch rate of change of the angle of elevation of the balloon when the balloon is 400 feet above the ground? So the 400 feet above the ground, notice that piece, that's not a rate. There's no per second in there. So that's just the height of the balloon at the time. So that's y equals 400. But they do want to know the rate of change of the angle. And so that would be the d theta dt. So that's our target, is d theta dt. So do we know all the other pieces? And the answer is no. We know dy dt. So we could take this dy dt right here, and we could plug that in right there. But the other thing we need to know is theta or secant of theta. Either way would get the job done. So... Let's go ahead and try and sort out what that secant of theta is, because then we would have everything that we need. So now what we're going to do is we're going to draw another triangle, but this triangle is going to be a specific one for the moment. So they're talking about the moment where the balloon is 400 feet above the ground. Our observer is here. This side is always 300. So what would this side be that connects them on that right triangle? So you can do the Pythagorean theorem. One of the kind of common triangles you should have learned is that if the legs are three and four, the hypotenuse is five. And that carries through if you add zero. So if it's 300 and 400 for the legs, then it's gonna be 500 for the hypotenuse. You can do the Pythagorean theorem and verify that for yourself if you would like. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, secant of theta is the reciprocal of cosine. And for the angle theta, cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse, so that would be 300 over 500. So cosine of theta is equal to 300 over 500. But secant of theta is the reciprocal of that, so secant of theta would be 500 over 300. And now I know that one more missing piece, right? Now I know secant theta, and I can plug that into the equation. And then the only thing that will be left is the d theta dt. So let's start trying to plug all of that in. And just start over here, lower left. So we're plugging into this equation right here, going from left to right. So 300 times secant of theta, which we just determined was 500 over 300. And then that is being squared times d theta dt that's the piece we don't know, but are trying to find, is equal to dy dt, which is equal to 20. So let's start that out with a little bit of simplica simplification. The 500 over 300, the, the zeros would cancel each other. So that makes it just 5 thirds. So on the left-hand side, we have 300 times 5 over 3 squared. That would be times 25 over 9. And that is times d theta dt, which is equal to 20. All right, so just continuing to simplify, 3 goes into 9 3 times, 3 goes into 300 100 times. So where are we at this point? We have 100 times 25, or 2,500 over 3 times d theta dt 
is equal to 20. And then to get d theta dt by itself, we can multiply both sides by the reciprocal, which would be 3 over 2,500. That would make these cancel over here. Do the same thing on the other side, 3 over 2,500. And now we have d theta dt by itself. Doing a little bit more simplification, we can cancel this 0 with one of those, and then 2 would go into 250, 125 times. So it looks like d theta dt equals 3 over 25. So d theta dt is equal to 3 over 125. And then what would the units be on that? So when we do calculus, we're always doing the units in radians, and then the time was in seconds, so this would be in radians per second. So the angle is changing at a rate of 3 over 125 radians per, check, per second. And did they just say change? They did say change. So the other thing I would say is that that angle is increasing because we have a positive rate of change. That means that we have an increase in the angle. So the angle is increasing at a rate of 3 over 125 radians per second. All right, let's look at one more example. An inverted conical water tank with a height of 12 feet and a radius of 6 feet is drained through a hole in the vertex. If the water level drops at 1 foot per minute, at what rate is the water draining from the tank when the water depth is 6 feet? All right, so let's go ahead and try and think about that a little bit. To come up with our formula, I actually want to think about what rates they're asking us to find. So it's a little bit different from our normal order, but they're saying at what rate is water draining from the tank? And I want to think about like what variable is that a rate of change of? So when they talk about water draining from the tank, that is water leaving, which is reducing the volume. So in order to see at what rate water is draining, you want to see at what rate the water in the tank is changing, and that's going to help you sort out the issue of water draining. So we want to come up with dv dt. That's what we're really looking for on this one. And if dv dt is what we're trying to find, then we need a formula that involves that involves volume, and it needs to be the volume of one of these conical tanks. So from geometry, that formula is the volume equals one-third times pi r squared h. So that's the formula for a volume of a cone. And if we take the derivative with respect to time of that, it'll give us a dv dt. Notice h is in there, and they talk about when the depth of the water is 6 feet. They talk about um, the water level is dropping at 1 foot per minute, so that's a dh dt because the height is changing. So that's a good piece to have. So this seems like a good start, and we're going to want to take the derivative of it. But it does seem like everything is just about h and v. I don't see um, any dr dt in there anywhere. So one step that can be useful here is to try and get rid of the r altogether in the formula before we take the derivative. That'll make the math simpler. It'll make it where we have to use the chain rule less and we don't have to use the product rule that way because right now we would have to take a product because of the r squared times h right there. So let's see if we can get rid of the r altogether. So how are we going to do that? So let's go over here and mark up our picture a little bit. So let's just focus on the water. So here is the height of the water right here. And here is the radius of the water right there. And if you look at that triangle, if you put this edge on here, then you have a triangle in blue. You could compare that to this triangle that I'll draw in purple right here. That's the big triangle. Those two triangles are similar triangles. And we know that this big height right here is 12. So we can use the idea of similar triangles to try and come up with an equation that relates to r and h together. And if we do that, we can maybe get rid of the r. So I'm going to take this horizontal distance here over the vertical, r over h, should be equal to the horizontal distance in the big triangle over the vertical distance in the big triangle, which would be 6 over 12. 
and then I'm going to multiply both sides by h, and then I can reduce the fraction as well, and I get r equals h over 2, because the 6 goes into 12 two times. And if I take that r equals h over 2 and plug it in right there, then my volume equation will no longer have r in it. So that's what I'm going to do and say that v is equal to 1 third times pi times r, which is h over 2. r was squared, so this will still be squared, times h. So what do we get when we simplify that? So we would have h squared times h, which would be h cubed. So we would have pi times h cubed in the numerator. And then we have the 2 squared, which is 4 times the 3 which would be a 12. So we have v equals pi over 12 times h cubed. So now we'll take the derivative with respect to t of both sides. So the left side would become dv dt. And on the right, we do the power rule, bring the 3 down, leave the pi alone. Now it's h squared and still all over the 12. If you're wondering why, aren't, why am I not using the product rule? Why am I not using the quotient rule? Because the pi over 12 is a constant, which I can just think of as moved out to the front. So I really only have to focus on the h cubed part of the derivative. But while I'm doing that focus, I do need to remember that the derivative is with respect to t, and I'm differentiating h, so I have to think of h as a function of t. So after I do our normal kind of power rule, bring the 3 down, subtract 1 from the power, I still have to apply the chain rule and go times the derivative of the inside function, which is the dh dt. And now let's start analyzing, like, what do we have? We already said dv dt is what we're trying to figure out. So this is the piece that we want to find, which means we want to be able to plug in for everything else. So how about the value of h? Do they give us that somewhere? So going back and reading the problem, at what rate is the water draining from the tank when the depth is 6 feet? So, yes, they are giving us the h of 6. So h equals 6 is going to get plugged into this. What else do they give us? The water level is dropping at 1 foot per minute. That means that dh dt is negative 1. If the water level is dropping, then the height of the water is getting shorter. So I have to put that dh dt as a negative one because I know the height is dropping. All right, is that everything we need? I think it might be. So we need h. There it is. We need dh dt. There it is. So we've got everything we need. Let's go find dv dt. So jumping down here, dv dt is equal to, let's see, this 3 goes into that 12 four times. So we have a pi over four out front. We have h squared, which would be six squared, times dh dt, which is negative one. So what do we got there? Um, negative 36 pi. When I do the square and move the negative out front over four, but then four goes into 36 9 times. So we end up with dv dt is equal to negative 9 pi. And then what should the units be on this? The height was given in feet, and now we're talking about volume, so that should be feet cubed. And how about time? They were talking about in feet per minute, so... That would be that the volume is changing at a rate of negative 9 pi cubic feet per minute. There's the dv dt that we were looking for. I think we should give our answer in a sentence here because we didn't exactly find what they asked us for. They asked us at what rate is the water draining, and we're telling them the volume is changing at a rate of. So they're saying at what rate is it draining? We're not saying it's draining at. We're saying the volume is changing at. So we need to change it to a the water is draining at type of sentence. So the water is draining out of the tank.
at a rate of 9 pi cubic feet per minute. So why didn't I put negative 9 pi cubic feet per minute? Well, because if it's draining at a negative rate, it's actually filling. The volume is going down, which means it is draining. So when you have a positive outward flow of water, the volume will be experiencing a negative rate of change because the volume will be decreasing as water drains out. Should we put 9 pi or should we put 9 times 3.14159 dot dot dot? Um, for that, you just have to follow the directions. If they say put an exact answer, then 9 pi cubic feet is what you want. If it says round the answer to two decimal places, then okay, fine, we'll go to the calculator and we'll do that. All right, that wraps up section 3.8.